Welcome to Tell Us Something. Mark Gibbons has been around in and out of Missoula all of his life. He grew up in Alberton, went to college at the University of Montana off and on. Mark Gibbons worked at whatever jobs were available from labor to teaching. He's been married all of his life. That's what he told me. I had flippers the other day. The two best things he ever did are almost 30 now. His sons, one in graduate school and one working in the woods. And one of them is, can do a backbend like you've never seen before at, at, in, in yoga class. It's amazing. Mark has been lucky that he's been able to entertain himself with reading, writing, listening to, and telling stories. Please welcome Mark Gibbons. careful what you wish for. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I didn't have any idea what to say, and uh, it came to me just in the middle of the night, tell that one. So, I mean, it's like you're in a bar, you're telling stories all the time. What are you going to tell? What are you going to choose? And so this one just popped in, and like Pat's, it's not mine, but I'm going to tell this story. And if I run over, I didn't hear a gong yet. Did someone hear a goddamn gong? It's been, oh shit, I've already lost 30 seconds. So bear with me. Oh, there's the gong. All right. So uh, I'm going to do this fast, probably, because the story happened fast. And here's, here's the way it happened. I, uh, I was working for a moving company here in town called Blair Transfer and Storage. And uh, we got a call that uh, a guy wanted his stuff picked up in Drummond. And so the boss says, yeah, go on out there. His house got hit by a truck. Uh, and so he needs us to take all the stuff out of the house and bring it back into storage while they're fixing up the house or whatever. And I said, okay. So we take off and we arrive in Drummond, me and my compadres, uh, Lump and Leo, who worked here for many goddamn years. What a great guy. And Leap and Larry, the other great lumpin' dude I worked with. And the three of us showed up anyway at this guy's house in Drummond. And, and, he, and, and he says, yeah, come on in. And, and when we got there, you know, there was like one side, the west side of his house was tarped. And obviously where the truck had, had hit the house. And so, you know, we walk up and, and he goes, yeah, the stuff here is inside. And we said, well, what's the story? You know, I mean, we, we heard your house got hit by a truck. And he said, incredible, uh, unbelievable. He said, you wouldn't believe this story. So, okay, so he, he starts telling us. He said, you know, obviously, I don't know what happened with the driver, but it was uh, it was a fall of the year, you know, about... 8 o'clock in the morning, 8, 8.15 in the morning, and this guy was uh, was driving, he was heading east, eastbound, he obviously just dropped some, some uh, I think, seafood or something, it was a refrigerator trailer, and uh, Kenworth tractor, and he was heading back wherever he was heading to, and he, and he held about a quarter full, maybe, that's where he was at, mostly empty, so that's, we're talking about 50,000 pounds, probably rolling down the interstate. And if you all know Drummond, the way the interstate kind of swoops north around the town, uh, he was heading around that north side of Drummond when he lost control of the vehicle. And uh, it had been raining all night. Maybe there was black ice on the bridge. Maybe he hydroplaned, lost control. Maybe the guy fell asleep. No one, he, this guy didn't really know. But anyway, when, when, when he left, the interstate, he was headed on a straight line toward this guy's house who lived on the north side of Drummond. And, you know, to, to change direction just momentarily, this guy's wife had uh, recently, you know, empty nesters, 
and uh, she wanted a new house. And so she'd asked him, you know, we've got to do something different. We were, but he thought, well, let's build a new house. And so he bought some property out, you know, towards Peaberg, out in the sagebrush area, the open spaces where more sun was. And uh, he started building this house. And so she was inspecting the house and going out there. And she wasn't, you know, caring for it. And he got almost to finish. She said, you know, I don't like that whole thing. Why don't you sell that house? And let's do something with this house. I always loved this house. Let's expand it. So, okay, he said, go ahead, talk to Bill, we'll call him Bill, this uh, carpenter, and, and, and he'll come over and you'll figure it out. So they sat down at the dining room table at a seven o'clock that morning and started hammering out sort of a blueprint for what they were gonna do to enlarge and make the house a wonderful new place for them to, to live the rest of their days. And uh, they, they'd done this at the, at the dining room table, you know, Bill and the wife, and the old cat, and I don't know, the cat was about 14 years old on one chair, over coffee, figuring it all out. Yeah, looking great. So, okay, it's almost 8 o'clock. Bill's got this other project he's working on. He's got to go. So he moves toward the front door. They get up. They leave the table. Bill walks out the front. She's right there at the front door saying, hey, thanks. I was looking so forward to this, all that kind of thing. About that time is when the fucking bomb goes off. <laughs> and how the bomb happened, he said, he said the interesting thing was is that after it happened, he said, I went back to see the pathway that that truck took. And so he said, I'll tell you what happened. He said, you go up to the interstate where that truck left the interstate, and there's a hole, of course. There was a hole where it went through the guardrail. And then at that point, there was nothing for like 25, 30 feet. Nothing. No sign of anything. Just a hole. And then all of a sudden, there was a furrow, kind of a trough, that started down the fill slope, right? Where the rear of the trailer started to touch down because that goddamn truck went <laughs> off the goddamn interstate. It flew like a rocket through the air. And as it was coming down, the trough, the back of the trailer just started digging in. And then about halfway down, all of a sudden, tire tracks. <laughs> and, the, and the goddamn thing was like, whoa, a freight train. And you know, I, mean, I drove a truck for a long time, and I had an old uh, 91 International. It didn't have cruise control back then. You had a goddamn throttle lock. And, and so I'm guessing maybe that's where, because this was 30 years ago this happened. And uh, I'm guessing it was locked. He was probably doing 80 plus miles an hour. And he got to the bottom of that fill slope, and he blows through what? The chain link fence, of course, at the bottom protecting you from the interstate highway. He blows through the chain link fence and like six feet to the right is a propane tank. And right in front of the propane tank is a single wide trader house where a woman, a young woman with an infant had a daycare in drum. And the people had just dropped off all the children. And so she had like four toddlers in there, and all of a sudden, boom! Just like eight feet from, from the corner of that place, blows by that on a dead run. Well, he's got across the neighbor's backyard, this guy's neighbor's, before he gets to his house. The neighbor's wife is sitting at the window of her house doing the dishes in the morning. She's doing the dishes, looking north towards the interstate. You know, it's just breaking day, but it's dark and rainy and all that shit. And so she's looking and, son of a bitch, here comes the goddamn freight train through her backyard. And, the, and this thing hits the side of her garage, the corner of her garage, which there's a goddamn Bonneville Pontiac in the garage nails the Pontiac, blows it through the garage, out the other side, and then what's all, all that's left in the direct pathway before it hits this guy's house is a single building, the woodshed. And this guy had already done his firewood chores and filled that woodshed with rounds of larch and fir. It was full, probably 10 by 12 foot woodshed. And he hits it dead on. Just obliterates this woodshed. No more. The woodshed is gone. 
it's gone, man. And the next thing that happens, just before it crashes across his driveway into his house, his wife had a small compact car sitting in the driveway. And the truck clips the rear quarter panel of that car. And he said, I swear to God, that car did not move but it flipped 180 degrees. <laughs> just went, oh, just like that. In the, in, was in the same spot, he said, I swear. And then into the side of his house. Well, the side of his house, on that side, the west side of his house, oh, shut the gong. Oh, you're kidding me, I gotta stop. I gotta, oh, oh, keep going, okay. All right, so it goes into the side of the house. It goes in, and the back porch is along that wall, man. Right on that side, and it blows into the back porch, paint, you know, all that kind of crap. And that. But also on that side of the house is where the power, the Montana power, kind of came into the house. And it blows into the side of his house, his wife, of course, over at the front door, saying goodbye about the wonderful remodel she wants to do on the house. And 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 and, and, and it blows into the house. Well, you know, when after the bomb went off and the dust is billowing out and everything, all that rubble came to like within two to three feet of this woman's feet standing at the front door. And of course, in shock. And, and the guy pulls her out the front door as the dust and everything is coming out the front door. And, uh, and you can see light in there, the headlights from the Kenworth. And so he wonders, you know, what happens to the, to the guy who's driving the truck? And so he, he sticks his head inside, of course, and tries to see something. And, and pretty much he sees the dome lights. The Kenworth come on. The door kind of opens. The truck driver stumbles out of the truck, you know, and he stumbles outside. And, uh, and the guy helps him outside. He's got a little cut on his forehead. And, that's, and, and, all, and the neighbors are showing up and the sirens are starting, the, the drumming, you know, volunteer. They're, they're, they're showing up. And, uh, and, 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 and at that point, and everybody's thinking like, oh my God, this is amazing. We're all here and they're touching each other like we're still alive. <laughs> Out the front door, here comes the goddamn cat covered in dust and diesel fuel. <laughs> Not a soul, not a soul was harmed in this whole goddamn experience. And uh, he said it's phenomenal. He said, you know, when I, when I clean this place up, because he said, when I clean this place up, we hold seven dump truck loads out of this house. And he said, in those loads, I found a piece of guardrail. I found chain link fence. I found rounds of firewood in my living room. That's amazing. And uh, and it was like, oh, the other thing he told me is, you know, that house was probably built in the 30s. It knocked the whole goddamn house about six inches off the foundation. So he didn't know how he was going to deal with that, but he wanted us to take the furniture, and we did, and that's the story. Emily Walter, is also a poet, and she lives here in Missoula. She arrived here first by accident, and now she lives here by choice. Hey, Blake. Now Emily lives here by choice. When she's not writing or skiing, she runs a cooking school, and I'm getting a text. I'm hoping it's not Emily going, I'm not here. Oh, oh, I hear her. Oh, good. So here comes Emily Walter. Please welcome to the stage, Emily Walter. The first man I ever loved was an older man. Technically 77 years older than myself. Yeah. Oddly enough, my mother introduced us. In the spring of 1996, I graduated with a degree in classics and poetry from the University of Michigan. While my friends were busy with their internships to Brooklyn, moving to San Francisco, I was thinking it was the 15th century. 
I never really thought about a job. I just thought I would continually write poetry. So I had a rude awakening when I realized it wasn't 1492 and I was no Michelangelo. So maybe like a lot of English majors, what they did was land in their parents' basement. Now I'm really lucky because my parents are nice people and they have an equally nice basement. But what makes it so nice is where I grew up. I'm from a tiny spit of land. It's a peninsula within a peninsula in northern Michigan. It's the Pinky. It's technically known as Leelanau, and it's Ojibwa for land of delight. And it is delightful. It's filled with hardwood forests, cherry orchards, wineries, and this expansive land is filled and surrounded by sandy beaches. And what outlines all of this is Lake Michigan. So to be in this area for the summer wasn't really that bad of a destination. I waited tables, I saved money, and I came up with an equally logical plan as my degree, which is to travel through Eastern Europe in the middle of winter. So I had some time, and my mom came to me at one point and said, have you ever thought about in-home care? <laughs> and I mean, it's not completely illogical since she's a geriatric nurse, but I was like, no, I don't, I don't like to babysit. And she's like, no, it's not babysitting, they're just elderly. So well, what would I have to do? And she said, well, you know, you'd have to cook meals and maybe read to them and do some light cleaning. And I was like, well, do you have somebody in mind? And she's like, yeah, I do. It's kind of old. I was like, well, how old? She's like, well, he's 99. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> but I, I agree, you know, I was kind of interested. Um, we're poets, we you know, want the experience. So I agreed to meet him. And so it's, it's what happens in this part of the world in the fall is that the lake completely changes. It, 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 you know, in the summer, it's this beautiful clear blue, and then it takes on this completely different identity in the fall. It's always windy, especially on the leeward side of this peninsula. It's constantly windy. And the lake just takes on this darkness. So I, I went to meet this man. It was late fall, and it was windy, and it was dark. And it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I went to this house, and I'm knocking. And then I'm ringing the doorbell, because I'm thinking, he's 99, he can't hear anything. So the door opens and fumbles, and standing in front of me is a man in his underwear. And I'm like, it's totally like babysitting. So I said, hi, I'm Emily. You're, you're supposed to be here at four. I said, well, it is four. And he just slams the door. And I'm like, okay. So I wait, and I wait, and then all of a sudden he comes back as a completely different person. First of all, he's dressed. Um, he has pants on, a well-buttoned shirt, a cardigan, and he stands there. And even though he's slumped, I could tell he has broad shoulders. And he stands, and out comes this giant hand. And to extends to me, and he says, I'm George Hathaway Littell. And I look up at him. And he has these eyes, clear blue, the color of August. And I think, I want this job. <laughs> and so I shake his hand, and it's awkward, of course, and we sit in the living room, we have this odd kind of dialogue. I went to school, here's my portfolio, please don't ask me if I cook anything. <laughs> but I got the job, and I proceeded to come back the next day at four. And so I learned to make a really good gin and tonic. I gave George this gin and tonic, and then I proceeded to try to cook something. At this point in my life, I knew how to cook two things. I knew how to make hummus and black bean burritos. Neither of which do you give to an elderly person, right? So I realized I need to learn how to cook. So thankfully, I'm fumbling through this cookbook that my mother gives to me. It's like Midwest Fair, okay? And so I'm figuring out how to cook, 
And thankfully, he has cataracts as well as just probably happy to have someone there. And at first, we sit in the kitchen, and I give him these, this plate of food, which was supposed to be broiled whitefish and ends up being burnt. And it's on plastic plates, it's fluorescent light, and we're pushing food back and forth, and we're getting to know each other. But things changed. I got better at cooking. And what would happen is I thought, well, why don't we just go into the living room? So I unearthed his wife's china. I lit some candles. And we had dinner every night together. And then afterwards, we would sit around this fireplace. And we would tell stories. And so for this entire winter, we would sit around and, and tell each other. I mean, obviously, George's 99 had a lot more stories to pull from. I was 22. I only had other people's ideas. But he never made me feel that way. He listened. I went off to Europe with my plan. And George wrote me letters. He typed letters. When he would use his typewriter, he would sit there hunched with a flashlight and type beautifully, beautifully composed letters and then sign it and send them to me. And I came back from Europe and I worked with him for a few more months and he took me out for my birthday and he bought me a beautiful scarf. It's pretty easy to figure out how this story is gonna end. He's 99. I then turned 23. But what isn't so easy is to tell you it's a love story. You see, I think sometimes intimacy is the real mystery. You can't ever really choose who you love in this world. And you certainly can't choose who's going to love you back. But this is what I do know. Every August, I go back to Michigan. I go back no matter where I've lived in this world, and I go to North Beach. It's the beach that rests outside of George's home. I go there by myself. My family never asks why I go there. I think they know why. And what I do in that August light is I swim and I swim. And then I walk that beach, and I look to the west, and I wait until I can get quiet. And then I think I can hear George say, write me a poem, Emily. Write me a poem. Thanks. John Turk received his PhD in chemistry in 1971, which is when I got born. John wrote and developed the first environmental science textbook in North America. He left academia to engage in extreme expeditions in remote parts of the world John's two-year kayak passage across the North Pacific Rim was named by Paddler Magazine as one of the 10 greatest sea kayaking expeditions of all time. His circumnavigation of Ellis Mir and Eric Boomer was nominated by National Geographic as one of the top 10 adventures of 2011 and awarded Expedition of the Year by Canoe and Kayak Magazine, John chronicles his journeys and mental and spiritual passages in a trilogy of three books. Cold Oceans, In the Wake of Joman, and The Raven's Gift. Please welcome John Turk. And the cold 
reached inside your nose and tickled the guard hairs in your nostrils. And then it seeped into your sinuses. And then it reached down the trachea until finally at the last moment the cold was stopped by the last vestiges of warmth in our core. We were traveling across, around Ellesmere Island. It was a 1,500-mile expedition. We were pulling our kayaks. The plan was to pull the kayaks through the spring into the summer until the sun melted the ice, and then we would paddle to finish our journey. But right now, right this instant, when the wind was in our face and it was 20 below, well, what would you wish for? <laughs> you would wish that it would warm up. Not next month, but maybe tomorrow would be a good idea. So our wish came true. And the wind came out of the south. Ooh. It came from the equator. Ooh. It came across the Gulf Springs stream, bringing moisture, and it started to snow. Big, heavy, wet, sloppy flakes of snow, and the next day we were walking thigh deep in slush. And, and you, you know, this wasn't merely an inconvenience, ladies and gentlemen, because we had a certain amount of food and a certain distance to travel and rescue in that polar zone is virtually unthinkable. And if we didn't make the journey before the food ran out, we would die. So, you know, I, I talked to whatever power there is and I said, well, you know, I, I wasn't explicit enough. I didn't explain my wish clearly enough. We didn't mean just a little bit of warmth, but how about real warmth? Like, maybe, please, if you don't mind, above freezing. So the sun came out, and the temperature rose, and it got really warm. Well, this is western Montana. You know what happens when it gets warm, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? The snow melts, right? Now, we're walking on the sea ice, and there's big blocky chunks of ice, and the wind-drifted snow had made these ramps over and through the ice, so dragging our 300-pound kayaks was relatively easy. And now that the snow melted and all that was left was the ice, we had to lift our 300-pound kayaks over these jagged pressure ridges, one boat at a time, one inch at a time, and now we're making 20 meters an hour 15 meters an hour with 1,500 miles to go. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. When you have 1,000 miles to travel and you're crawling, what do you do? You wish for something, right? <laughs> well, okay, you know, I realize I've been kind of piggy and I haven't been explicit enough. And look, look. I don't mean just a little bit of warmth or even a lot of warmth. I mean, we want it to be fucking hot. <laughs> I want this ice to melt. This was a sea kayak trip. We want, we're on the ocean. It's summertime, it's July. I want the ice to melt and there to be open water and we can paddle. So the sun came out, well the sun was out 24 hours a day and it was the end of July and the, you could hear the big ice groaning and moving, this whole polar ice ocean coming to life. And it splits apart. And from one day to the next, 
It's an ocean that you can walk on, and now it's moving pans of ice, and in between, there's water. Just exactly what we wish for. And now the wind comes out of the north again. And it drives the ice, an ocean full of ice against the shore, against the cliffs. And we have pieces of ice as big as a football field, six feet thick, smashing into the ice, smashing into each other. And ice is flying into the air, and chunks of ice are leaping skyward. It's a kind of ice that has sunk the stout oaken ships of the British Navy. You can't go out there in a kayak. It just doesn't work. So, it's kind of like, look, I, I realize, you know, whatever powers you wish to, I, I'm really sorry, you know, I haven't given full weight to the true complexity of the deep ecology of the Arctic. I've been a little bit naive, you might say, just making little wishes. And maybe I've been a little piggy, you know, wishing for something instead of just being content with reality as the way it is, blah, 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 blah. But all of that said and done, we waited for 17 days. We have 30 days worth of food. We've used up half of our food and you know what's the lament of Job? I, you've been throwing all this stuff at me. Please. One more wish and just give me a break this time, okay? I want the wind to relax. I want the ice to spread out. I want there to be open water in between. And that's what happened. And the ice spread out. And the sea was mirror flat so you could see your reflection in it. And the sun was now losing sun angle. It was August and we had those pastel colors of the high Arctic late summer. And the seals were basking on the sea ice. It was the kind of environment that is not only wondrous for human beings, it's the kind of environment that every mammal on the planet would love. And that's when the polar bears came out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheyenne Rogers. Diane R. Rogers, you might have seen her on the side of your Eddie out camp. Or she might have served you a beer before over at the Southside Fellow House. She's a badass. She grew up in a triangle between Seal Lake, Missoula, and the Flathead. She plays I can't read my own stuff. She started skiing at an early age and fell in love with the mountains. Upon her senior year, she went to the Big Fort, Big Fort Whitewater Festival, and instead of her senior prom, she found a passion for a whitewater community and graduated from the Flathead High and attended Flathead Valley Community College, achieving an associate's degree in bar and beverage management Shane decided to move back to Missoula in 2001. Here comes Shane. My father was heading 
downtown from the north side to come out for drinks and good music. The top hat provided this. It still does. I love hey. it. I would often dream the day that I would be able to go downtown into the night. I ended up in the flathead with my mom and from time to time would see my brothers between Missoula and Seabee Lake. And I would wish to be closer to them. There's many ways that you can see your life go by before you. I would be on the high school sports bus between Calspell and Bozeman. I would look out the window, I would see their house, kind of my house, go by. And I would wish to be closer to them. When I got accepted to the Wilderness and Civilization program here at the U of M, I came down and began to look for a house with my brother Cedar. Knowing that the streets of Missoula are totally whacked, I still found myself laughing at the ridiculousness of how this town is mapped out. Slightly frustrated and over it, I met back up with him at Bernice's and I said, hey, I'll come back next week. And he said, well, what about this last one listed at the bottom? It's right back here. We rounded the corner and I knew this was it. This was our house. Immediately went to the property management and said, hey, we're siblings, family. You should totally rent to us. It worked. We got the house. I got to live with my brother Cedar for almost two years until the morning my father, our father, called and asked if his truck was out front. I looked out the window and it was not there. I rose out of bed, I took a shower, and as I took that shower I wondered is this a shower that I'm going to take before I find out that my brother is dead. You hear it in someone's voice. What he knew that I did not was that right before Lubrick, past the Potomac tragedy of the Good family, was Cedar's truck, rolled over and over. When our father called back, it was the same voice of the father that I heard years prior when he called from San Francisco to tell me that my brother Gavin, who was laying in a coma, hit by a train, was not doing very well. I could hear the grief in his voice, and I could hear it at that moment. It took five years for us to heal. My father went on to marry his sweetheart, Alex Wolf. I landed a job at the Kettle House, a place where my brother Cedar had first introduced me to with the party pig. <laughs> we started to feel a rhythm in our lives again. My youngest brother Holt found a passion in cooking and travel. It was like almost things became normal. I was able to buy my house the house of my dreams. It's never a good thing to have an officer outside of your house. One day, when I was on break from the Kettle House, I came home and he asked for Holt. And I said, any business that you have with Holt, my brother, you have with me. And he said, your father just rolled his car by Salmon Lake and he passed. And I thought, what are the chances? I can't believe what are the chances. So here I am, seeing countless shows here at the Top Hat. There's been a tr complete transformation of my life, of this town, of this building, and yet I am still here to tell you something from Taylor. Dawn breaks and isolates shards of bright daylight against last night lives highlights. Like graffiti in my mind serving to remind me of the scope of the site set, set to touch down right about now. The who, what, when, where, and why, and how the who is me and my extended family 
traveling in synchronicity to where we need to be. For what else could these people be if not roots of a tree? Supporting loose leaf, spiral bound philosophy when hip hop first accosted me. Circa 1993, Cedar and me, smoking THC, rocking us a copy of the Chronic LD. On these streets, which will forever may, remain Missoula, Montana, currently serving time as the MC in the Five Valleys area. Tell me, how could you let this big sky be a barrier to what's going down underground? Tell me, where else can you go skiing in the morning, college in the afternoon, fly fishing in the evening, and somehow still have room for a freestyle session or two? Before, dawn breaks and isolate shards of bright daylight against last night life's highlights. Everything indicates that this shit couldn't be, but then again, this is Missoula, Montana. Reiterate the situation I will do for you. We got rednecks with glocks and tech nines and land is poison extracted and refined, but I'm doing just fine as I maneuver my way through this maze of soccer moms and minivans and Caravans of tipsy hippies all trying to get further than the heat can reach on one hour of sleep. Smoking blunts of keep that they grew in Hawaii, at least that's what they tell me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'm amused because it's these stories that they say that I pick up and save for the day that dawn breaks and isolated shards of bright daylight against last night life highlights. Oh yeah, my lawn on the north side of the valley, where I know every street and alley that leads to the same places and faces that have given support. As the first line of defense, not as a last resort, I've seen too many fall short, too many never take flight, too many drunken fistfights between my friends after midnight. To not want to write an open letter to all about this place, Missoula, Montana, an entity, an entity unique unto itself. Like the pieces in the glass shop that they don't put on the shelf. The mixes that the DJ's still spinning for themselves. To maintain the health of this hip hop head, I recommend a steady diet of ill rhymes fed. Hey. I, ain't a white bread with, I ain't a white boy with dreads. I won't break dance for bread, but what I'm asking you to visualize is what I just said. As a 486 word painting of an intricate web. <laughs> 